And so most suppliers are always happy to take your money up front. Absolutely. <laughs> Just stepping back, Chris, on, uh, on the uh, last question uh, you asked me. When you're buying a property, um, tax should be a consideration, but not the main consideration, whereas before I may have implied that you don't consider tax at all. But yes, you do make a consideration. Yeah, but it's never the number one not reason. Not the number one issue, no. Yeah. Is there any um, kind of maximum amount of money you can pay up front? Like, can you pay 10 years up front, for instance? No, the legislation limits you to 12 months uh, only of any expense. So you've got uh, 12 months in which to pay, and uh, that, 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 that's about it. It will not allow, if you pay for 13 months, that extra month will not be allowed as a deduction. Cool. And the other thing is, is sometimes accountants work out depreciation. Should they be going to the accountant or should you really be going to a quantity surveyor? Look, in the old days, where the accountants used to do it. And uh, for a while there, the tax office uh, used to question it. And so uh, the new quantity surveyors have uh, turned up because they are really engineers and cost estimators and they produce a much better report than what we do and of course the tax office relies on it because they're specialists in that area. Sure. Joining me on the panel of experts tonight is Shakri Barbara from Property Tax Specialists and Doug Driscoll from Star Partners. If you've got a question or want to join the discussion, number to call is 1300 30 34 35 or send us an email to property at skynews.com.au. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the show. Joining us tonight is Shakri Barbara from Property Tax Specialists and Doug Driscoll from Star Partners. If you've got a question about property and want some advice, give us a call on 1300 30 34 35. Now tonight we're showing you a few different properties from the western suburbs, some uh, cheap ones and some expensive ones. The next one we're going to look at is in a place called Cherry Book and uh, I think this is on the more expensive uh, end of town. Do you want to uh, tell us a bit about the property? Absolutely. It's, uh, well, it's the opposite end of the spectrum to uh, the, uh, the property we showed your viewers earlier in the show. Um, Cherrybrook, for those that don't know, it, is a very salubrious conurbation um, just outside Castle Hill. And this property is uh, being advertised at uh, 1.4 million as an asking price. Um, and we estimate that a, a rental return would be somewhere in the region of uh, 1,200 a week, uh, which again, for a property of that value, uh, represents a, a good rental yield. Um, it's more for the the, the executive let, if you like, but uh, as I said, it's a very, very nice part of the world. Yeah, and look, those pictures that we've got up on the screen at the moment uh, look pretty fancy. Now, as you say, the, the rent return is about 4.5%, which you wouldn't expect on million dollar properties. Quite often that comes down to about 2 or 3%, mm -hmm. which is why as investors quite often we're investing under a million. But would that be a reasonable rental property, an investment property to have in that kind of area, or more of a family home? Um, look, it's probably more of a family home, um, but uh, as I say, if the, the numbers are to be believed, then that's a, a phenomenal investment. Um, so look, I think it caters for both audiences unquestionably. Yeah. And the capital growth expectations, re reasonably good in that kind of area? Yeah, I would say so. Very, very popular area. Um, great transport again, very good schools, very popular indeed. Properties don't sit on the market for very long. Yeah. It Shakri, in terms of trying to get into um, various properties, obviously for a lot of people, trying to find $1.5 million isn't going to be too easy. No. If they have got big budgets though, is there a, a set price range that you think works particularly well for investments or is it have a couple of big ones, have a couple of small ones and a bit of a mixture? The, uh, the trying to get there uh, uh, depends on your strategy and depends on the individual circumstances. There are a lot of strategies that uh, people out there who are promoting how to buy and how to create wealth. But uh, you've got to balance uh, some of the cash flow with the capital gains. Uh, you need the cash flow in order to keep going, uh, but you find a lot of the properties that are going to grow very highly don't have a lot of cash flow. And so if you can't balance, you'll get exiting the market pretty quickly, uh, especially as has happened to a couple of my clients when the interest rates went up uh, and they were forced to look at letting go of some of the properties uh, that they, they had. Yeah. How you generally find in the rental market at the moment? Well, to use the uh, local vernacular, it's going gangbusters. Um, I mean, I'm not exaggerating. Across our offices, uh, we've got a, a less than 1% vacancy rate at the moment. Um, so, uh, phenomenally strong. I myself am looking for a, a property to rent, and uh, um, you have to struggle and fight to get through the front door of a, a property on the open home on Even Saturday. Even when you're one of the heads of the chain. Oh, it doesn't make any difference, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a phenomenally competitive marketplace. So, again, great news for investors, I guess. 
And that's the thing is, I mean, that should be some of the positive spin out there is that they're talking about a buyer's market. They're saying like prices are falling in some areas. But in terms of when's the time to get into the market, mm. you don't have to pay a premium price now. Expectations are that rents are going to be going up. Yeah. Is that not the perfect time to invest? I would say so. And also to add to that list, obviously they're talking about uh, interest rates remaining relatively stable over the coming months and possibly years. So uh, I would, if I was an investor, I'd look to do something now, no question. Yeah. What's your thoughts from the financial side of things? Look, from my view is uh, uh, if you can get into the market, and I take advice from the people who understand the property market uh, overall, but uh, this is the time to enter on a low budget. You have to go in, whether it's a low budget or a high budget, if the value of properties are lower than expected and you're looking for growth, get in now if you have the cash flow and if you have the circumstances to support it. And, and the golden rule is cash is king. You've got to be Absolutely. able to hold on long term. Absolutely. Should you even be buying with an expectation of getting in and out in, in one or two years or should it really be five or ten years? Uh, that depends on what the expectation from the market is and depends on, I have uh, some clients who have a cycle of uh, three or four properties uh, every two years. They buy four, they, uh, they sell three and they keep one and they use the gains, they're, they're modest gains, but they, they use it to uh, build up the remaining property, which is usually a growth property a half the time. So uh, there are different strategies and you've got to follow, you've got to stick with the strategy because you're usually very familiar with what to, how to get value out of the property in that case. Yeah, sure. Now we're going to jump to a bit of a case study to give you some ideas on how to structure your finances and certainly your mortgages. And so in this case study, we're suggesting that a local eye in Australia goes and buys a home. Then over the next few years, they start paying off their mortgage. And then for, say, some work reasons or for semi-retirement or something, decide to travel overseas. Then a few years later, they return to Australia. And because the last house was pretty big, they don't need so much now, maybe the kids have left home, they then go and actually buy a smaller home. And with their old house, they continue to rent that which they've done while they're overseas. Now, that seems, Shakra, is a reasonable thing to do. Where's, where's the potential uh, problem or, or way to kind of tax plan this? The, 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 the problem is this, uh, if you have paid the uh, home loan off your home off, uh, then you can't get a deduction for interest because to get a deduction for interest, it all depends on how you apply the borrowed funds. So if the borrowed funds are repaid, then you cannot come back when you buy the next property uh, and get a deduction for the interest. However, if you do use an offset type of loan, uh, then what you have is a one side of the loan is a fully drawn advance and the other side of the loan is a deposit. But the interest is calculated on the net of the two. Uh, so if you have excess cash and uh, in, in that circumstance overseas, uh, you would have these people earning quite large amounts of money and so they've got a lot of cash to apply against the loan. You would put it in the deposit and therefore your dollar amount of interest is much lower uh, and, but when you come around to buy the next property, you can take that money, make a private purchase, but the interest on the loan will revert back to the original loan and you will get it as a tax deduction. So you're literally financing your new home. 